Believe it or not, whether you believe it or not, I have a cult, a class of. Oh, wow. Um, so sometimes those are the best. So uh, I think most of you know who I am, but I'm David Redden. I am uh, vice chair of the Department of Biostatistics. I am the former chair of the department. I voluntarily gave it up because I involuntarily took it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm also the director of the Center for Clinical Translational Sciences, Biostatistics, Epidemiology, and Research Design Unit. And I'm going to just give you a very informal talk. I like conversations better. Uh, some people will say that means he rambles, but I prefer to have a conversation. And I'm going to talk to you about something that nobody bothered to teach me in graduate school. Nobody. For all those years of studying all that mathematics, all that, those classes actually called design of experiments. The official title was design of experiments. Don't be fooled. They did, we were not designing experiments. What we were doing is we were learning how to do every form of ANOVA under the sun. <laughs> Nobody ever really sat down with me and ever talked to me about how to design a study. And it's quite ironic because that's what I spend 75% of my time doing, helping other people design studies. And a few, and I'm going to give you some examples from my um, recent, I'll just say the past few weeks, where I've been working with some very senior individuals designing something, and we keep drifting away, and I keep having to bring us back and try to focus us using what I jokingly call the Magnificent Seven questions. I'm working with someone who is very junior. I do not mean that in any derogatory sense. This grant is going to go in just a few weeks, and I'm having to emphasize, you made these decisions months ago. You cannot change, if you, if you want to say I'm changing my mind, that is your prerogative. You are the PI. But if you change your mind, this late in the game, you might want to wait a cycle. Because these are the key fundamentals. I'm not going to get into a lot of stats. If you want me to do heavy stats lectures, I'll be happy to come back and do those. But that's not them. I want to discuss. Okay, I just want to discuss these questions. Uh, when you come, we do bird clinics. But I want to take that off the table. You should anticipate us discussing these questions with you if you come to a bird clinic which is here on Wednesdays from 11.30 until 1, and on Mondays 10 to 2 in the edge of chaos. You would, if you come to me and you bring me a new project, for me to become immersed in that new project, I'm going to start asking these questions. Or, better yet, if you come to me and say, David, I've got a, a new study I want to design, you'll see that I will start with these questions over and over, and they serve as an anchor. Uh, ironically, when I'm at study section, if you see my cheat sheet, you know, when you're at study section, at least when they used to be willing to fly you up there to meet in person, but if you can see my cheat sheet, you will see that I have title for everything I reviewed. I have title and PI, but then I have simple notes. You know what I've written out? I've written out the answers to these seven questions. Because if I can't answer these questions definitively, I'm going to triage you. And in fact, it's very often you will see that in review groups, these are the questions people are asking by a fundamental level before we get to the heavier questions of technology. Think because if, you, if this isn't clear, nothing is clear. All right? And like I said, if I can't find them, it's a very challenging review. So it's kind of like laying a foundation of a house. Uh, let's back up. Please understand, we've got an audience of seven. 
I usually teach, um, when I teach the undergraduates, I have an audience of each class is 50 and 50 kids. And I like the way they treat me, actually. They won't let me finish a sentence. They'll cut me off mid-sentence. If they're not certain about what's going on, they'll ask a question. I want you to do the same. If you've got questions, just ask as we go through it. Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, be ready to make suggestions. If we, you, you could say, David, I think I should add a question. I would like to add a, a question to your Magnificent Seven. Okay, well, the Magnificent Eight is not going to sound quite as good, but we will do it. I did not want to call it Study Design 101. Best friend at all. Okay, because that's what some people call it. It's never dull when we're trying to design something. Uh, but I think seven is a reasonable question, and it's a good cheat sheet. So I'm just going to throw them up there, and then I'm going to unpack each one of them. And then we'll be right there on time with ten minutes to go, and we can all get our lunch. But here's in every one of them, and in some, in some ways I cheated. Some of them actually have two questions. But what are the specific aims, and do they translate into statistical hypotheses? Now I want you to start brewing on what that second state, what am I asking in the second? Especially given I'm a biostatistician, or a stat, well, I tend to have a statistician if you look at the PhD. The bio came after I got the UAB. Are outcomes clearly defined, and how are they measured? There's two nuances in how. I'm not asking about your technology. But I am asking about your technology, or how you're doing it, but I'm asking also what level of measurement is there. Is it really a measurement? Is the design retrospective or prospective? Please understand, I will get on my high horse right now. You can knock me off a bit later. I find designing retrospective studies harder than I find designing prospective studies. Retrospective studies, I have a lot more, you know. The only, the, only, the only certainty I've got is the data is already collected. That's the, that, does, that, that is a good thing, and it can be a bad thing. Is the design cross-sectional or longitudinal? It's a pretty easy idea. But again, I'm using statistical terms. Do you measure, how many times are you going to see your subject? I didn't say patient. How many times are you going to measure your subject? This can get confusing. I've seen things actually bounce out of study section because they thought it was cross-sectional, but it was in fact longitudinal, and they didn't catch it. How many groups? Let me emphasize right now. You know, don't be, ever be ashamed to come to me and say, David, I have one. One's enough, folks. One's enough. But if it's more than one group, then that may lead me into a different design. And then, what is a clinically relevant effect? That's always a very tricky thing. It's one of the trickiest things in a retrospective study. And how does this impact sample size? Um, I am a firm believer that it falls to the clinician to tell me one of two things. And this is a dialogue or the investigator. They, I need to know what is the smallest meaningful effect that you care about. That's a key piece of information. I'm not worried about what can be declared statistically significant. I need to know what's clinically meaningful. Sometimes they have to come back to me and say, well, I know what's clinically meaningful, but I can only afford this number of people. Well, I need that piece of information too. And then we do a calculation around <laughs> those restraints. So Go we, ahead. we are, I don't know about you guys, but we're not actually clinicians. Okay. So can I just change that to biological relevance? Yes, in exactly. My state? That's fine. Okay. You can change it to scientifically mm -hmm. relevant. For a, for a study I'm working with right now, I'm worried when we go to publication. The PI is very excited because... We're showing that the different techniques produce different measurements. We have the same phantom that is being used 
So we've controlled for it. There is differences in what the different machines are saying. And this clinician is very excited about it. I'm looking at it and going, yeah, but they're very small differences. And because the machines are so precise, I'm getting very high statistical significance. But is it meaningful? That's what I'm struggling with. Then what should the analytic approach be? Can I be very honest with you? In many ways, I don't care how you flip the first five around. Okay, you can flip those first five around any way you want to. Those are the ways I naturally try to lead people through them because that's the way I think. I always think, tell me what you're measuring. That will give me a hint. Tell me retrospective, prospective, all of these things. But the last two cannot be moved forward. Six and seven, those last two are completely dependent upon the front of the answer of the first five. And in fact, that's another thing that happens a lot of times when I'm doing reviews for journals. I'll get, most journals will ask for a power calculation. I get a power calculation, I look at it. I look at the analysis they did. They don't have anything in common. Can't happen, folks. The power calculation has to link directly to whatever analysis you did, or else you're just you're fooling yourself. So, what are specific games, and do they translate into statistical hypotheses? Uh, so, this is interesting. These are two that actually came in through the uh, walk-in and the walk-in clinics and the office hours. Test the effect of a six-week exercise program on the cognition of geriatric patients. Okay. We want to know. Uh, the bottom line is what they proposed for us, but there, here we go. I understand certain things. I'm actually measuring cognition. Uh, I'm probably going to end up randomizing people to either exercise or something else and observing them over time. The effect of a six weeks exercise program tells me not necessarily that it is longitudinal, but I'm going to recommend them into being longitudinal. I want a baseline measure. I would love to have a three week measure actually to help in follow up and then a six week measure. Demonstrate that, I should say, that bacteria X is present in the biofilm of bacterial vaginosis. That's not a, that, to me, is not a testable hypothesis. And I have gone round and round with this person. And this is going to be going in soon. But to me, my comment is, thanks for talking to me, but stop asking me to write an analysis plan for this. And here's why. It's very simple. I've asked one very basic question. How are you going to show that the bacteria is there? I am going to take a picture of it. You are. How are you going to take a picture of it? Well, I'm going to make it glow green. Yeah. Are you going to quantify the elimination? Nope. Okay. You're going to quantify anything in the experiment. You're going to measure anything. Nope. You're just going to show them the picture. Is that a statistical hypothesis? Now, if the person was going to say they were going to quantify the, the amount of bacteria, that's fine. But just the illustration that she can produce cases and say, look, these cases, that bacteria is present, to me, I'll help you design it. I will talk about how we'll summarize descriptive statistics on the, the people. But as far as telling me you've got to I'm, she's having to take me at faith. I've said, might be good if you could tell me how we could measure them. No, no, we're just going to use the pictures. As my old joke is, folks, when the atom bomb blew up at yeah, the Manhattan Project, when the atom bomb went off, we know we had generals there, we had scientists, we had American politicians, we had British officials who knew about it. Legend has it that a Russian spy was present, at least Stalin said he had a spy present. But I'll tell you what wasn't present, the biostatistician. 
because that experiment produced physical evidence that didn't have to be quantified. Question. So why they didn't want to quantify it? Is I don't know. Well, I asked them to. <laughs> yes, Kevin? I mean, why can't you take them at their word that uh, the presence of visible illumination is a valid and reliable... I am taking them at their word. I'm not trying. I, the disagreement is this. I'm saying that is valid and reliable and sufficient. And she keeps emailing me, I need an analysis plan. An analysis plan for what? For the demonstration that bacteria X is present. And I'm like, I thought we had agreed that, and what we're struggling with here is not, let me ask you this question, between friends, between friends, we've known each, each other all for 18 minutes now. Do you think statistics is necessary for every hypothesis, for every statement in your range, or every statement in an experiment? I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not. But I mean, you're still describing the prevalence of a dichotomous outcome in a population. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may still want to give like a 95% confidence in her. I, I said I would help her write a, and I did write for her that I would give her 95, if we had X number of specimen, that we would do a 95% confidence interval on the number of samples that illust demonstrated this, I gave her all of that. And she's asking for all that. But I would say, you're not calling that a statistical analysis plan? She's expecting more than that. So the problem is this is a descriptive question and she wants to make it, she wants to do a quantifiable statistic, is that? That's the Why aren't we doing regression? Why aren't we doing, and what do I have to regress on? So if she actually did the appropriate qualitative analysis, you don't have a problem with this? Well, I is mean, that the, is that the... you could do like logistic regression. Maybe it's going to vary by age, and so you'd want to regress age with you know, the outcome of whether or not bacteria X is present. But all she said is she didn't ask for me to test a hypothesis that these covariates affect the pro what she right. said is demonstrate. Right. And I'm not going to go beyond that. Hmm. We'll see, Kevin. I agree with you. Okay. Well, can you put some words in her mouth and suggest some of these? I I will go back and suggest those, but at the same time, to me, if the primary thing is she wants to say, I can show you. Nobody else has thought about this, but this bacteria is going to be in that biofilm. If that's your research, I'm, what I'm trying to get across to all of you is, or at least my opinion, it is not required that every aim or every statement has to have a statistical, just a, a statistical approach to it. I don't believe that. Never will. So. so it's good. In fact, I'll be very blunt. We've got we're doing pilots now for the CCTS, and every one of those that get into phase two have to meet with um, a methodologist. I went through that whole list, and I put those that I felt were pure basic science in the sense of all they're trying to say is we can make it work with the most senior individuals in case we need to make an argument. Let's, let, let's not go stats heavy on this. All right, so those are the things. Now, do you, does everybody understand what I mean by a specific aim? You know, we use that term in grants. In your, in your dissertation or your thesis, it would have been your primary result, the primary thing you're going after. All right, that seems kind of silly, adding, but I'm going to tell you this. A lot of people, everybody thinks this is a joke. It's not a joke. I walk all over this campus. If you see me stop on the street talking to somebody, there's a good chance somebody stopped me to ask me about a polymer calculation. And, hey, how many people will I need for this study? Without knowing the specific aims, without having any idea, because one of the things Kevin just diagnosed, well, David, you could make it a di dichotomous variable. You, then you could do this. I can't do anything until I have that piece of information. So those ideas, okay? So always be ready to present the idea before you rush toward doing 
power calculations and discussing analyses. And I'm a hypocrite because I'm trying to rush there too. I always want to get there, but it's best to hit tap the brakes and discuss these things. Please keep in mind this. If you're struggling to write them, don't sit back and say, well, I can't go talk to a, methodology, a statistician or an epidemiologist or somebody who is very quantitative until I've got all this worked out. Wrong. No. We can help you think through it. Think it through. Okay, because what I'll do, if you come to me and you say, I'm trying to build that, David, I know I'm being recorded, but that's okay. There's plenty of, that, there's plenty of stuff already on the internet that I've said. Uh, my division chair is pushing pressure on me to get a grant. David, my department chair is pushing on me to get this. I'm going to say, but I can't come up with a name. And I'll sit back and say, well, let's have a cup of coffee. And I'll start asking you, what do you think are the most important things to measure in your experiment? What is most fascinating to you? And why is that fascinating to you? What's the most curious thing you can see in your literature right now? What are they measuring? I'll take you away from writing an aim and then start asking you to think about outcomes. Outcomes if you're stuck. If you're stuck on the aims, a good place to jump is to the outcomes. You just lift them out. That's why I said sometimes flipping the order of the questions can help you writing out the study design and assist you in writing the aims. Because if you start thinking about the, what you're trying to measure, that may be the thread that helps you pull on this and open up a, a long series of questions. Okay, are outcomes clearly defined and how are they measured? There is nothing more frustrating than studying something, reading a paper, going through all these things, and then having to say, what did they measure? What have they done? And why have they done it? And I can't figure out what they measured. List. <laughs> you're going you're to laugh at me. List all the outcomes out on a, on, on a sheet of paper. David, can I put it on my computer screen? I would prefer a sheet of paper. <laughs> I would prefer a sheet of paper. Old school. Just write them down. Beside each one. People hate me for doing this. Put down primary, and if you have to, put down primary one, primary two, though I'll start squirming at that point. <laughs> then put down secondaries, then put down tertiary or exploratory. Don't go crazy. Math, the statisticians like, I have one word that everybody, nobody else uses in their life, but I use it all the time. <laughs> Parsimony. Mm parsimony, folks. I have databases, I mean just multiple databases, of grants sitting in rocks. One of the saddest facts to me is we analyzed five or six outcomes, well, five or six things in that huge database, but we made all these individuals fill out 200 questions. What were we doing? And why? Oh, well, one day there's going to be someone who's, who's that someone? If we're not going to do it, I'm not certain anybody's going to do it. Is it primary? Is it secondary? Is it a rating? All these things. Or is it a real quantitative measurement? Okay. I need to know these things because they greatly affect what I can help you do. It will greatly affect what in this interaction of you tell me the aim, I'll tell you the appropriate analysis. I'll help you write that plan out. Um, can, I t can I give you a tidbit of advice? Sure. Don't develop scales. Do not ever say that you're going to come in. What? Did I offend somebody? No, I'm just thinking we do a lot of scoring, and so on some. But it's sort of a set scale, zero to four. That's fine. Yeah. No, no, no. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> I'm not saying you can't use ordinal data. Yeah. I'm fine with that. But don't come in and tell me, hey, you know, we're going to do this grant. And on the side, we're going to develop this new interest instrument that's going to measure 
suicidal tendencies on your throw one out there. Because first, if somebody's already published it and it's validated, that's a far stronger argument to use that than to say, I'm just going to develop something new. Because the first criticism you're going to get from a journal editor mm -hmm. or you're going to get from reviewers is, what's the phrase? Is it validated? Validation is a lot of work. Okay? So, but the key thing here, and you're going to laugh at me, if you're using a scale or an instrument, like the CESD depression scale, which I know that because I've been, been doing a study with Florida for 10 years, get the publication reference. You know why? You know why? Not because you're going to be putting it in the, you will probably put it in your journal article, all of these things but it will help the methodologist know key things, like what's the standard deviation of that instrument. You don't have to know these things, though. They're published. The more we can cite that, the better off our, our design's going to be. Is the design retrospective uh, or prospective? Please, please understand, this is a key question. That does not mean you get to skip the seven questions. It's not, I've got the data set, I get to go skip the seven questions and immediately get to go to go. Uh-oh. You still need to slow down because even if all the data has is available, you still have to come back here and say, well, what, which one's the outcome? Where is it? How was it measured? Was it measured consistently? Here's my biggest problem with with retrospective studies is from 1970 to 1980, we, me we measured it this way. And then starting in 1981, we started measuring it this way. And people want to use the whole range, and we've got to talk about what's going on. How do we, how do, we do that? So there are massive issues that you have to do. Um, if anything, retrospective studies are equally as hard as perspective, or at times harder. Uh, at this point, I do think you should talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, with regard to, if you are going to be doing a perspective study, and let me really just put it this way, suppose you're doing an animal study. Uh, do you have inclusion and exclusion criteria for an animal study? We should. We should. Or at least we should have a clear description of which animals are being used. Tell me how old they are. If you purchased them from Jackson Lab because they had you wanted certain genetic characteristics, tell me all. So those types of de details are in, I kind of put underneath the retrospective prospective. Yes, Kevin. Kevin, you don't have to raise your hand. We've known each other for years. <laughs> um, this is probably a dumb question, but do you have like a, a simple and reliable way to differentiate perspective and retrospective? And do you do you think there's like hybrids where there's components of both? Yes, <laughs> there are hybrids, and there is that that middle. Prospective means literally to me your engagement with a subject. You're making them set for consent is in the future. I mean, that, that's like a, a good way to think about it in terms of like IRB, like it's a that's the way I think about it. That's the like, way I think about it. Are you? But you don't think about like, am I assessing um, exposures or outcomes at what point in time and before or after they happen or before or after I enroll the patient, that, that doesn't matter to you? No, no it does not. If it's prospective, you're enrolling them and... Otherwise, no. Otherwise, I'll call it retro. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable with that? Is that, is that like uniform, is that standard, or is that more like a no, pragmatic? That's a pragmatic. There's nothing, we, I could probably come back and give you specific, give you different cit citations on how they, people, certain groups define perspective versus retrospective. But to me, that works very well when I'm trying to help people think about their studies. All these questions are designed to do, they're designed to be, honestly, a 15 minute cup of coffee to launch a new project or to bring somebody new up to speed on a project. Somebody just came in, joined the project. You can sit down with these seven questions, you can bring somebody up to speed. But is it critical to like label in your grant application if it's prospective or retrospective, or if you tell people what you're doing, can they sort of make that decision for themselves? Like, they I'm can. I'm enrolling people who are being discharged from the hospital or 
going to go back and review their chart and see what happened during the hospitalization, and then we're going to passively assess whether they get readmitted, and you can call it a retrospective or prospective, but I'm enrolling the patients at no, the time. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. The, my comment to you is do you have to call it out to a reviewer? The answer to that is no. Qualify. you got to make it clear to the reviewers, always. I, you know, I hate to say it, I eat a lot of humble pie with regard to revise and resubmits. Sometimes I think I was very clear in my explanation of what we were doing in what we had measured, how we had done. The reviews come back either from the journal or they come back from the study section, and clearly somebody was confused. Now I can get angry, which I do. <laughs> I can say some bad words, which I do. But it rests upon my shoulders because I can say, well, it was clear if you had not reviewed it on the plane as you were flying in. <laughs> I should have known they would review it on the plane while they were flying in. It wasn't clear enough. So my rebuttal is always, almost, uh, we recognize the reviewer's point. We have strived to make this clearer, period. So, um, Kevin, that's an excellent point. There are hybrids in there. If you're going to do that type of study and get it funded, I just think you've got to be clear about it. Just, just, just to further that point, I mean, because a lot of times I see papers that are clearly doing like a secondary analysis of a prospective cohort where they come up with a research question years after this data is collected, mm -hmm. and they're calling it like a prospective study. And I, I'd want to say, um, even though you had a prospective cohort is the reason you collected this data, this is still retrospective. I would agree with that. I would be very clear, I would argue that that is a secondary data analysis based upon a, pro a prospective cohort that began at this time, is the way I would describe that. When I think retrospective, when I think retrospective, I think the way I would argue if you have you want to do the old-fashioned, how we know smoking causes cancer. We cannot, you know, you know, all these IRBs will not allow me to randomize people to smoking now. But what we did is it was just the basic case control. We started studying people who had cancers. And then we looked back in time. Looking back in time to see what were their exposure histories. But you could also do a perspective observational like cardio. You know, they may have said at the beginning, like, we're gonna, we have planned right. to ask this question, we're gonna ask, it. we're gonna do very detailed smoking history, we're gonna collect that at multiple points in time, and we're gonna be uh, super aggressive about looking for cases, and we're gonna, I agree. again, be able to say this is a perspective. That's a perspective one. I'm not saying that, please don't, please understand something. A, I really probably would be fired as a statistician shortly. I don't believe all studies have to be randomized for us to make solid statistical inference. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Never believe that. Nor do I believe that a, a, a given hypothesis must be delivered over here to retrospective side or delivered over here to prospective side. I can go either way, depending on what is my preference and what is available to me. But both those approaches require thought about the design. That's all I'm getting to. Cross-sectional. Um, each of these questions are providing the building blocks for an analysis plan. Uh, what is probably being asked is how many times we you measure the subject? So let me ask you something. Let me point out, and I keep saying subjects. Because if you're one and done, if you're just one and done, that's just a pure cross-section. If you are, and be careful here, okay, because it gets confusing. I study mice, this is not in the study section, probably 15 times. I'm studying mice, and the mice 
live, the first set of mice live to six weeks. And then for me to have my measurement of that I need, the four mice are dispatched. I have another set of mice that go out 12 weeks. They're dispatched. Last group goes 18 weeks. They're dispatched. What type of design is that? Cross-sectional. That's a cross-sectional study. And we get it in study section all the time. We're doing this longitudinal. No, you're not doing a longitudinal study. You're not doing a longitudinal study. If I have to analyze that, that is a one-way ANOVA if that's a continuous outcome. If it's not a continuous outcome, that's a chi-square. But I got three groups. Three groups there. Then I've got the other study that we balance everybody out for also. We have a group of mice. We measure them at six weeks. Excuse me, six, uh, six weeks. They go forward again. And I measure them again at 12 weeks. They go forward again. I measure them again at 18 weeks. And I get told this is a cross-sectional study and that time is a factor. That they're going to do a two by three ANOVA. No, these are repeated measures. So that's a that's a repeated measures ANOVA. So do you see where I'm going? I'm getting very statistical right now, but this is crucial for me to get to the right analysis. Because if I re Kevin, if I measure your blood pressure three times in the next hour, are those independent observations? No. They're not independent. They're not, they're not three independent observations. One, one analysis, all observations are one, one description that I just gave you, they're all independent. The next one, they're all dependent. They're just, a, they're, they're just sets of dependent observations that have to be accounted for. And again, keep in mind when I say this, how many times will you measure the subject's outcomes and explanatory variables and covariates? deep side. I have one investigator on this campus that tells me over and over, well David, you designed an, an explanatory, I mean you designed a randomized study for us. You know that. You wrote the randomization program. You gave it and you set up the codes. I'm not glad. Everything, everything's broken. I don't need any explanatory variables. I've broken the association between whatever the treatment is what, and Whatever the and whatever the explanatory variables are, true. But you still have to measure them because I think that could give me more statistical power. Okay, so this is why you sit down with people. Yes, Kevin. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Please tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. No, I was just getting nervous when you're saying that you want to measure covariates and stuff for a randomized study because. If, if then you end up doing a regression, and then you've sort of lost the, maybe the, the purity and the benefit of randomizing to begin with. Okay, so I wish I had a chalkboard in here. Just remember, if you think about the triangle, the confounding triangle, those three things. So here's a, here is what I'm randomizing into, and I want to blow up the bridge between age and blood pressure, right? Suppose I'm doing a new blood pressure drug, and yes, I am going to balance age across those two treatment groups. But my randomization will not dissolve the association between age and blood pressure. So by introducing age, I can bring up statistical power. It's a trick. It works. And even though it's balanced, that association still exists. But I agree with you. The first thing I do is the crude analysis. And then I do the other ones. All right. How many groups? This can be a tricky question. It sounds easy, but it's often reviewed in grants, and this is one of those where it's, there's the mistake. Um, you need to count the number of interventions and dose levels per intervention, or you need to think about if one of the things that, for example, 
sometimes I have drug and behavior in a situation. That's actually four groups. You get neither, you get drug alone, you get behavior alone, or you get the combination of them. So just think about that. The answer, I have one group, is valid. A lot of people come in here and are apologetic for it. I'm like, there's nothing to be apologetic for. One group studies are perfectly fine. Okay, I can, I can test associations. I can look for those types of things. All right, that was five. Clinically relevant, biologically relevant, just please do not come to me and say, I want to detect a statistically significant effect. <laughs> don't do that. I don't mean that bad. This is the hardest thing for uh, investigators. And I know this. I've done this for 23 years, sitting down with them. When I start these series of questions, it becomes very challenging. There are ways we can assist you. If you will bring, you know, like, remember when I said that issue about if you're using a scale, bring the reference, bring the paper. Because, let me ask you something. <coughs> Suppose you're, we're doing IQ. I just play with IQ. IQ is designed to have a standard deviation of 10, right? I know that, it's a standard deviation of 10. Um, let me ask you something. Do you think an IQ, you know, that what I would do for someone is I would start out with, do you think an IQ difference between two groups of eight points is significant, is clinically relevant? What's your oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that'd be pretty good. Yeah. Then I'll just bring it down. What about five? You think that's still clinically relevant? And it's just a discussion. Then I would say, well, what about two? Two points. Would two points suppose that if I was wondering about the impact mm -hmm. of the impact of a specific drug on memory? And we were using a scale and it has a standard deviation. Um, let's just say 10 points. Is a two point difference alarming to you? And I would have to lead people through that. Do you know what game I'm playing right there? They're the person who set up all the, the science behind statistical power calculations was a gentleman by the name of Jacob Cohen. He wrote this book. It is dry as burnt toast. <laughs> Do not read it. <laughs> Don't. But he generally indicated that if you're looking at group differences, to think about it in terms of what's called effect sizes. And effect sizes are just the difference between the groups divided by the common standard deviation. So that can be inverted. So if I tell you that the standard deviation is 10, and I multiply it by 0.2, that's a two point difference. And he said 0.2 is a very small effect. He said 0.5 is a medium effect. 0.8 is a very large effect, in his opinion. So we tend to guide people along that continuum. Not every, every grant or paper needs a power calculation. I'm just going to say it. I do not believe that. I do not believe that everything requires a power calculation. I will argue if you're going to use a p-value to justify or use that as your scientific evidence of impact or measurement, you're going to get called out on power. So yes, if you're planning to use a p-value, it's always prudent to talk about power. Okay, but under these conditions, this is where we're finally getting to um, actually, the analysis. And then what is the an If you've answered 1 through 5, notice I didn't put 6 in there. Everything is determined by 1 through 5. Everything I need to know to get to the completely fleshed out design and analysis is at 1 through 5. The answer to these questions is predetermined in most cases and has been restricted to a handful of options. It is important everyone understands this fact. If you've answered one through five in any order, oh God, Mike's, I really nearly stroked about a year and a half ago. So I do a lot of stuff with rigor and reproducibility. And NIH put out all these videos about rigor and reproducibility. 
reproducibility and statistical and all this stuff. And in one of their skits, the PI is just sitting there going, yeah, I think we should do a repeat of measures of NOAA, follow that with, and do a follow-up post hoc comparison using chi-square. It's just gibberish. They've already talked about what the outcome is. This is not a repeat of measures of NOAA, but yet they're putting on this skit. And what bothered me about the whole skit is you don't get to choose on question seven. Q1 through Q5 determined what the answer to what Q to question seven is determined. And you do not know how many times early in my career I still face this. We have worked two months on getting this stuff ready to go. All right, two examples, please. Sorry. Then I'll let y'all go. Worked all this time fleshing this thing out, getting it ready to present or to go in. I get a call on my cell phone 24 hours before it's locked, before we're supposed to submit it, but we're changing the outcome. Does that have an impact? <laughs> Does that have an impact? Yeah, it just decimated questions six and seven probably. You change the outcome. If you go off of, if you say, well, I'm decided on second thought, yeah, it's continuous, but I'd rather think about it as yes, no. The whole thing's changed. Power calculations out the door, analysis plans out the door, time to revise. Because it needs to line up. If there's a disagreement in study section, it gets problematic. Uh, the other thing I want to point out to you is I helped, I sat yesterday morning with an assistant professor. Guy wants to pull his hair out. I'm serious. He had to read his very good paper, probably the, the, his primary paper out of his dissertation. Two reviewers loved it. First reviewer argued he should change his primary outcome. And, you know, what are you supposed to do? If you change the primary outcome, you change the whole paper. Mm -hmm. If that's what you, you don't want to make that recommendation. You either say, <coughs> I'm going to reject it, and I think you need to go somewhere else because I don't think your primary outcome is that important. But to say, revise and resubmit and change your outcome, put them in a really bad spot because you're really asking for a full brand new submission at that point. So be, and I, I kind of felt like saying to the reviewer, do you not recognize the consequences of this recommendation? Yes. Are there cases where you've collected, like, say, blood pressure data and you've, you've analyzed this continuous variable, but then, oh, some new guideline just came out and they just mm -hmm. lowered the we blood did. pressure guideline to uh, quite now. And so now, tell me how, what percentage of your people drop below the yeah, guideline. Yeah, we do that all the time. So, so, I mean, wouldn't that be a reasonable thing to ask for as a, sec as a reviewer to say, like, you should add I, that analysis? But he didn't ask that. He literally said, "We want this. I want this one removed and this one in." And I'm like, "Hmm, I have no problem with. I do that all the time. Have you thought about doing this?" And if I'm the staff reviewer, like if I see something, I'll say, "Copy." I'll just say, "Have you double checked that? If this seems a little squirrely to me, have you double checked the normal probability plot? Have you done the follow-ups on these?" I have no problem with that. I just felt like that reviewer by just wholeheartedly saying, I mean, he was, it was really hijacking and taking it in a direction that you just, you seem to be missing our main thrust and, or you are not open to the idea of what we're proposing. But no, <laughs> we're doing that right now. American Heart Association changed their guideline and we're going back and looking at a lot of stuff and we're following those recommendations, but this one was just a little bit too far. Now, can I be very honest, Kevin? We wrote the most politically correct and sympathetic and understanding, <laughs> and we, did, we said we're not going to do it. And we were as polite about it as we could be. And I'm afraid we're going to get rejected for it. I really am. Okay, that's it, guys. So, with eight minutes to go, so, any questions? Any thoughts? Or should we add one? Should we take one away? <laughs> Anybody? Why is my phone?
phone not working. Well, good news, my phone's not working, so I can't watch my daughter and my wife get into another text war. <laughs> well, I think in this case, maybe if, if I'm the majority, I'll ask it to do a sensitivity advice and try to ask it to completely change that. So if a sensitivity advice can also support or partially support your original finding, then that will be fine. Rather than ask it to completely change. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Another you know question, or are you just stretch it? Well, yes, no, but are you staying for lunch? Or we... I'm going to stay for a few minutes, but I've got to get uh, some things in, and I've got to, we also have a faculty forum at 12:30. Hey, so let's just look at some data for what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool? Yep. I have a question. So, uh, yes, yeah, my question. If you found a one microphone, it's important, but it's unbalanced. What do you think? I'll put it in the <laughs> But if we put in a cover for the unmeasured, hmm? you have unmeasured cover. Oh, no. What? Right? Well, mm. <laughs> I mean, if, it's, if it's a super important variable that you were not balanced on, then in retrospect, you probably should have uh, stratified based on that variable. Because if you're, I mean, if you're flipping the coin 10,000 times, it doesn't matter, right? Like, you're going to get an equal. Yeah, you're just, you know, if you're going to flip the coin 50 times and age is super important, then you've got you've got to force age into... And you should put in the stratification. I would agree with that. But if there is one that comes up and you... It, a, here's the thing. It all boils down to, in retrospect, you see a significant variable that you were not prepared to account for, and you didn't put it into your stratification or into your randomization, but you can get it measured, then I would say, come in, do your crude first, and then do, and do a sensitivity, put it in there and see what happens. Because you know that there is a correlation and association, there's still a bridge between that factor and your drug. Assignment. The danger is you just don't have it. You never got to, you can't get to it. You don't have the measurement. You got to publish what you've got and state future research is needed and that you're going to have to, the study needs to be conducted in a way and account for blocking on this variable. So there's no other way. Well, there's plenty of things I wish I could do over in my career. Plenty of them. So. David, um, be yourself on the other side, design the study. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you have a story about that when you had to come up with it? Uh, so when I've had to come up with it, most of the time when uh, I have gone after my own grants, they have been more on the methodology side. So what I would have to be able to do is to, again, use these types of questions but I use them in a way where I'm trying to delineate what things will I change with regard to the methods. In other words, am I going to do a situation where I know, am I going to have one data set or one simulation where everything is met, everything is required, everything that should make the, the, the uh, uh, statistical approach perform optimally is that make that situation true, then start coming in and creating new groups. Let us drop the heterogeneity. Let's get, let's drop the homogeneity and put great heterogeneity into the data. What happens to our ability? What happens to the type 1 error rate? What happens to the power? All of these things. So I still build out this grid. I still write out these things over and over. It always comes back to these. You can just rephrase them, though. And in that process, you get yourself in trouble. I mean, you, you get in trouble with yourself. Where I get myself into trouble more than anything else is typically what Kevin was getting to, when we've gotten to the analysis stage, I become the kid in the candy store. And so, okay, we've done our analysis, now we've got these new criteria for what is hypertension, let's look at that. 
oh, well, now that I've got the door open, let me look at this. And I just start exploring things without first really thinking about what is the hypothesis. And then, oh, look, this was significant. And we do the just so, sto I, I get into the just so storytelling of, oh, well, that's just telling me that, and that's backwards. I need to think about it before I look at it. Um, all right, uh, let me, like I said, my phone's blowing up with, <laughs> believe it or not, the person who's frustrating me the most with this grant. 